really excited to actually be here with you this morning. Is my microphone on? Huge. That's better, isn't it? I didn't know if I would actually be with you this morning. And so that's why I'm excited. Um, and I'll share a bit more of that as we go along. But I really am happy to have a voice that can speak to you today. Over the past couple of months, we explored a series called Pictures of um, Faith. And we, we kind of looked at what the Bible had to say about certain topics. We looked at salvation. We looked at um, what happens when you die. We looked at uh, the authority of Scripture. And, and we, as your pastoral team, absolutely loved preparing those sermons. It was just wonderful to be able to, to bring Bible truth out and, and reaffirm our own faith as Adventists. Um, and I believe that many of you also enjoyed them. And so I'm, I'm really glad that those sermons spoke to your hearts. And so now we're kind of transitioning into a new sort of phase. And we've sort of kept this idea of pictures of. But it's more sort of, we're, we're being a bit more vague about the pictures. And um, as many of you know, I have been home the last two weeks recovering. And on Monday, as I was um, reclining on my couch and just thinking about the week ahead and, and many things, um, a sermon came to mind that I had heard a couple of years ago about when the enemy tries to take you out. And I, I kind of was trying to remember what was the passage that person had used and was trying to just pull it together in my head and it just sort of ideas kept popping in and then I went to bed and songs were popping in my head and I thought, okay, I need to, need to get this out. And so I will say that it is inspired by Charlotte Gambrell because she was someone who preached this topic a couple of years ago and I really enjoyed it. But of course, as always, it has been menderized, mendezerized. It's mine. And it's something that's been on my heart, particularly over the last couple of weeks. And so I just want to start with a question to you today. Do you believe that there is greatness in you? Now, many of us probably would almost feel embarrassed to answer that question or to even really think about it because, you know, but do you believe that there is greatness in you? This greatness is like potential, right? This, this huge potential. And sometimes it's untapped and unknown. But do you believe that there is actually huge potential in each and every one of you? Is that something that you believe? Let's consider this. I wish it was a much prettier light bulb. But I pulled that out of the lamp and I went, what? Where's the rest of it? But anyway, let's just consider the light bulb for a moment. Is there potential in this light bulb? Now, as I stand here like this, it just looks like plastic, glass, some metal. There's probably some filaments in there somewhere. And the potential of this bulb is that, yes, if I was in a dark room, it would stop me from stumbling when it went on. Or if I wanted to read at night, this light bulb has the potential to give me light so that I can read my book. Or if I want to gaze lovingly into the eyes of my husband. This light bulb has the potential to make that happen. But until this light bulb is plugged in and turned on, it's just a light bulb. It really hasn't quite met its purpose. But once it gets plugged in, potential and purpose come together and I can gaze, I can read, I can do things, I won't stumble in the dark because the light is now on. And I'm going to leave it on. Because a light bulb before it's plugged in 
has potential, but it hasn't yet met its purpose. You see, potential and purpose are designed to work together. They need to find each other. And it's important for us to believe that we have potential and then step into the purpose that God has set out for us. Now, it sounds easy because that was pretty easy. I took three steps, plug the globe in and hurrah, potential and purpose manifested. And in our life, unfortunately, potential and purpose is not quite so easy. Um, And particularly because there is an enemy who works to keep these two apart. If I was to sum up the devil's mode of operation, what his core business is, I would just simply read John 10.10. The thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. That's it, simple. There's lots of verses, but if I was just summing up what the enemy is all about, that's it. Steal, kill, destroy. The enemy wants to steal, kill, destroy. Not just me, not just Susie, not just Caroline, not just Marie, every single one of us. Never thought I would name people in church. There you go, you learn something new every day. The enemy wants to steal, kill and destroy every single one of us. He wants to make sure that our potential never hooks up with purpose. And um, so today I'm going to talk about how the enemy wants to take you out and that none of us are immune. And I want to share this through the story of of a well-known character in the Bible and through three voices that try to take him down, three voices that come through in the narrative that are designed to stop him in his tracks. And so if you want to follow along in your Bibles today, I'm really not going to be moving from this one chapter. So you can turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we're going to read a story that really all of you have probably heard because there's a giant and there's a young man. But we're going to read it really differently today. We're going to look at some voices that are in this story that are designed to shut David down. So I'm going to start reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17 because I just want to set the scene. And so I might skip a few verses, but just I'm just going to start reading. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soko. Where, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekar in Ephes Demon. Saul and the Israelites had gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. So here's our scene. It's a, it's a battle scene with soldiers on both sides and there's a valley in between. And every day there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze and on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for a battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants. And so on and so forth. And this is the scene at the beginning. Two armies, huge giant you can kill me we'll be your servants if I kill you you become our servants and nothing's happening and now enters David into this story and so let me keep reading verse 12 now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse who had eight sons in the days of Saul the man was already old and advanced in years 
The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of these sons were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest, but the three eldest followed Saul, and David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now for 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Morning and evening, and still nothing's happening. Now Jesse said to his son one day, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp, your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See how your brothers fare and bring some token from them. And so here is David's first little job. His dad is going to send him off to deliver some bread and cheese. Now, he's been tending the sheep and he's been kind of, I guess he's kind of like the Uber. You know, he's delivering food backwards and forwards. Um, but on this day, we, we get the story in full. And we know that David is a shepherd boy. Does David know his potential at this point, do you think? Do you know what David's potential is? Well, in the previous chapter... In 1 Samuel chapter 16, it begins with, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Do you know this story? So Samuel comes to where Jesse and his boys are, and when he arrives in the village, the people are actually a bit scared. They're like, Why is Samuel here? because this prophet was a bit feared. And then Samuel says, I want to I want to meet with Jesse. I've got something special to do. So along comes Jesse and he gets all his sons ready and they all line up and Samuel sees the first son. He sees Eliab, the firstborn, and he goes, this is the one. This is the one that God is going to anoint as next king. Just look at him. He's, he's just amazing. And God goes... Lovely verse, you know, man looks at the outside, God looks at the heart. He's not the one. And he goes through all the sons and he says, no, none of them are going to be king. And, and Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any more sons? And then there's an afterthought. Oh, yeah, 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 there's one more boy. He's out with the sheep. Well, get him. And David arrives and Samuel sees him and he... I, I always find this verse just quite interesting. He said, he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. That's what we know about David. Beautiful eyes and handsome. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel set out and went to Ramah. And then there's a verse missing, I believe, that should have come straight after that which should say, and then David went back to his sheep. So David is anointed as the next king, and then he goes back to the sheep. But there's potential, right? David has huge potential. And now with this request from his father to take cheese and bread to the, his brothers who are part of the army, there's a sense of this potential might be just moving forward a little bit. It might be just moving towards some kind of purpose. And because, because this potential is finally moving towards purpose, we see that the enemy is starting to feel a bit nervous. The enemy is feeling nervous because what is going to start with a delivery of bread and cheese is going to end, sorry, spoiler alert, with a giant's head. And so the enemy is nervous because David's potential is to be the king. But he's going off to deliver some bread and cheese. So let me keep reading as we identify the first voice that David encounters that tries to shut him down. And I'm going to start reading from... Verse 26 in 1 Samuel 17. Jesse said to his son, Take for your brothers 
the grain, the ten loaves, the cheese, the commander, all that. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning. He left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke his same words as before. And David heard him. All the Israelites, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. And the Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him and will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. David said to the man who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine who should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. So his eldest brother Aliab heard him talking to the men and Aliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down just to see the battle. David said, what have I done now? It was only a question. He turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way and the people answered him as before. The first voice that comes up against David is a voice of limitation. And the voice of limitation will often come through those who know us. Those who know us the most. Why did Eliab burn with anger? What was his problem with David? Was there a memory of the oil running down his brother's head and him, the eldest, being rejected? But Eliab was jealous, I dare say, of David. And so his jealousy cuts David down to side, size when he says, just get back to your few sheep. Off you go. You're not wanted here. You've got nothing to offer. You can barely look after the sheep, so go home. The voice of limitation will tell you that you don't have the skills, the training, the education. You don't have what it takes. So just go home. Go home before someone gets hurt. Just go home. Don't waste your breath on the voice of limitation. Do you notice how David responds to the voice of limitation? He actually turns away from it. It says he turned away and he spoke to someone else. David did not let the voice of limitation take him down. And maybe there's a voice of limitation speaking to you right now and I encourage you to turn away from it and don't let it take you down. Let's keep reading as the second voice presents, picking up in verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one, no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a boy and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant is used to keeping sheep for his father and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul clothed David with his armour. He put on a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. 
David strapped Saul's sword over the armour and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. The enemy's second weapon here, his second voice, is a voice of manipulation. And this voice comes through Saul, who although is big in stature, is pretty insecure. And so Saul wants to control this situation with David. And he says, you want to fight? Sorry, I just had a Bruce Lee flashback then as I said that. You want to fight? Fight in my armour. Put on my armour. Put on my helmet. Put on my sword. Now, if David had gone into the fight with Saul's armour, who would it have looked like had actually defeated the giant? Saul is afraid, but he still wants to look good. And so he starts to manipulate the situation. He starts to control the situation. He wants David to make him look good. And manipulation doesn't like it when something in you is about to shine. The voice of manipulation will rise up. And unfortunately, some people are happy to see you shine as long as you don't shine more than them. The voice of manipulation will talk you out of doing what God is calling you to do by playing into our insecurities, putting conditions, making us do it a certain way, not the way we thought. But what I want to say is when manipulation speaks up, just do what David does. Don't be rude, be gracious. Because David says, I cannot walk in these I'm not used to them. He says it nicely. He says, you know what? I don't have to wear your armour. I can't wear your armour. It's not designed for me. And when God has called us to use our potential for his purpose, he's going to provide what we need. We don't need to put on someone else's armour. We don't need to do it like someone else. I'm not immune. I don't know how many times as I stepped into ministry, I thought to myself, I can't do that. I'm not as good as that person. I'm never going to be able to do what that person does. I'm never going to be able to preach like that person. I'm never going to have connect. I can't change to be like anyone else and I can't wear anyone else's armour and neither can you. The voice of manipulation is trying to shut you down and if you recognise a voice of manipulation then be gracious, but trust God. But God actually will provide what you need. Manipulation is just like limitation. It is an attempt to keep potential and purpose apart. Let's look at the final voice in this chapter. And I'll start reading from about verse 40. After David has removed the armour, he just takes his own staff, he chooses his five stones... He puts them in his shepherd's bag and with sling in hand, off he heads to the Philistine. Now the Philistines came on and drew near to David. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. I like how that was just slot in again. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this very day... The Lord will deliver you into my hand. I'll stop. The voice of intimidation sounds different for all of us. But it has one thing in common. It's designed to instill fear. 
Goliath is the voice of intimidation here and he challenges David. Who do you think you are? You puny little boy. I'm going to crush you. I'm going to kill you. There is going to be nothing left of you. You are nothing. You are going to fail at what you're doing. I am going to be victorious. Goliath is trying to make David afraid. David has been on a journey from potential to purpose and the enemy is working overtime because he does not want David or any of us to achieve our God-given purpose. We could talk about fear for such a long time because I think fear is the one that shuts most of us down. Somehow we manage to get through limitation, we might be able to get through. And even manipulation, we might be able to go, you know what, no, I, I know that God's going to provide, I can trust God. And then finally fear hits. And when fear hits, strange things happen. When I went to see the surgeon before my operation, he was an interesting man, capable, but as many people said to me, not, not an excellent communicator. And we talked about what the operation would be like and the risks because, of course, they need to, whenever you have surgery, there needs to be the discussion of risks. And um, the highest risk, which was not in the thousands, it was more in the hundreds, was that they nick a vocal cord because they go in through the throat. And, of course, if they nick a vocal cord... I lose my voice. And he said, well, you know, your job, does it require your voice? <laughs> Maybe. That was a fearful moment. Do I put up with pain and limitation or do I have the surgery? Fear can shut us down. But David doesn't speak to the voice of intimidation from his own strength, and neither should we. If we understand who we are, and we understand the potential that God has put in each of us, and that God says he will do what he said he's going to do, and that God is faithful to the purposes that he has set before himself, then we can trust in God, and we can tell the voice of intimidation I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. The God of the armies of Israel who you have defied. I had to tell fear to rack off because I couldn't stay where I was. And what I had to understand was that even if the vocal cord got nicked, there'd be another door on the other side. But I couldn't stay bound in fear. The enemy is merciless. He's out for blood, however he can get it. And more often than not, it's in the whisper of his voice. He sneaks. He's quiet. He whispers so that he doesn't raise any alarms most of the time. And in the, the passage that Kean read for us this morning in 1 Peter 5, Peter describes the enemy by saying, keep alert like a roaring lion your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. He's quiet, but he just prowls. He prowls. He's looking. Hmm. Can I just... Thanks. Thanks. How's it going? Good. <laughs> it's nice to see you in church today. Yeah. Was it an effort to get here? No, it's pretty easy. It's yeah. Kind of like that. yeah. So, what are you going to do after church? Uh, have some lunch. Did Marie cook it? Yeah. Is she a good cook? Very good. Are you just saying that so she doesn't get upset? No, I'm pretty honest. I bet you wish someone else had cooked though, right? No. Are you sure? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, my daughter. Okay. Mm. 
the devil will just sneak in. Now, he doesn't need an open door. He just needs a crack, just a little crack, and he'll just slide in and he'll start whispering. Maybe he'll start whispering about something that is limiting you or something that you're worried about. He'll just take it and just keep going. He does not need an open doorway. I don't know if you saw how close Marie and Anthony were sitting. Holding hands even. (laughs) That's how easy the enemy slips in. In the movie The Lion King, the villain, a lion named Scar, he doesn't take control through force, through strength. He creates situations. He creates a particular situation and puts young Simba in the path of an oncoming herd. He quickly gets the father. Quick, your son's in trouble. The father comes, he saves the son, but the father dies. And then Scar slinks in. Oh, Simba, what have you done? your fault run run away don't ever come back Greg Morse writes that Scar like humanity's greatest adversary does not overwhelm he outwits his whisper not his bite ruins souls and what makes the worst villains so dangerous their words. You think the enemy won't try this with you? He tried it with Jesus. Do these words sound familiar? If you're the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all their authority for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. The devil is always looking to devour. He is looking to limit, to manipulate, to intimidate, to take you out. But did you notice that the devil is like a lion? In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says the devil is like a lion. He's a fake He's a lie. He's not a real lion. And everything he says is intended to stop you fulfilling your potential. So what do we do? I want to just look at this rest of this, these verses in 1 Peter 5, because Peter writes this. After giving us a picture of of the devil as like a roaring lion wanting to devour, he says, resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. The devil's not just going after you. He's going after everyone. If you are trying to fulfill God's purpose for your life, if your potential is busting to plug into purpose, the lion's after you, the pretend lion. David was anointed as king and then he went back to the sheep. He was ridiculed by his brother who can only point out his limitations and then the king, Saul, in his insecurity wants David to wear his own armour into battle so that others can think it's him and he's doing everything he can to manipulate and control the situation and finally Goliath. Goliath is intimidating David. 
He wants to make him afraid. He wants him to not only fear for his life, but for everyone. The enemy wants to steal, kill, destroy. He doesn't want David to succeed. He doesn't want David to reach his full potential. Because somewhere down the line in David's full potential and purpose, there lies a little baby named Jesus. However, Peter continues in first chapter First Peter chapter 5. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Everything that the enemy tries to take from us, God restores. God supports, God strengthens everything the enemy tries to take from us. The lies he speaks, the intimidation, the manipulation, the suffering he brings, the despair he tries to sneak into our hearts. It's God who restores. When the enemy speaks limitation, don't waste your breath. Just turn away. Turn away. When manipulation speaks up, don't be rude. Be gracious. But most importantly, trust God because he will provide. And when the voice of intimidation tries to speak up, then you tell it to get lost because you're going to come against it in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. Because it is God and God alone who has given each and every one of us huge potential. Huge. And he's also set purpose. And he wants those things to come together. When we see this, when we truly understand just how much potential we have, the enemy can try his worst but it won't stop us when we understand that God is with us. The enemy will whisper many words to take you out. But actually, God whispers many words too. For every lie that the enemy speak, God will speak truth if you listen. I love you. I chose you. I redeemed you. Your weakness is perfect in my strength. God wants our potential to plug into his purpose. And so when the enemy whispers, shut him out and listen to the whispers that God is also speaking to you. I just invite the musicians to come up. As we finish this morning, I want you to not just sing the words, I want you to believe the words. I want you to understand that these are the words that are true. You are not limited. You do not need to be controlled and manipulated by others' ideas and thoughts. And you don't actually need to be afraid because God is with you. So let's stand and let's sing these words as a truth of who God says we really are.